Uh, Mikola and Jordi have been putting together something for us today and uh, anyone who's ever done any outback travel uh, with or without amateur radio will uh, get something from this. I'm, I'm quite confident. <laughs> so uh, tell us um, uh, a little bit about what you're doing. And... So uh, I'm Michaela. So my talk is uh, radio communication for overlanding. So radio in um, like four wheel driving and outback travel and that sort of stuff. Um, and some of the considerations that, that go into that. Um, so I've got my call sign up there, VK3FUR. You might have seen me uh, on the air or heard me on the air. Uh, I've got an email address there if you want any questions or you can see me after. And our car is the silver four wheel drive over there. So since we're talking about a lot of stuff in the car, if you want to see any of it in a practical sense, just jump over there and we can uh, demo different aspects of it. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is a lot of these topics are like entire talks by themselves. So I'm just going to be like skimming the surface of some of the stuff that uh, we've done and how we set things up. Um, but you can get into some very technical aspects uh, of this. So I've tried to include some QR codes to some references. Um, so if there's any, anything that stands out. Um, some of the slides have some QR codes, you can scan that and uh, get some more detail. Um, but yeah, just afterwards, questions, um, come over, see the car, um, and might be able to answer um, any of the questions that you have. I guess first off, what is like overlanding? It's sort of more of a US term. Um, some people say like four wheel driving or just, you know, outback travel. Um, uh, for us, it's basically driving in very rural, um, uh, remote areas. Uh, so we did the Canning Stock Route recently, which is about a two-week drive um, where there's just no cell phone reception. Uh, you're on one road. There's no, you know, there's very little ways in and out of that that um, that travel. Uh, so if anything goes wrong, you're sort of on your own or passes by. Uh, we probably spent uh, about seven to um, seven to eight days without seeing an, an, a single other vehicle, uh, which is, I think, insane. Um, so, yeah, Geordie's uh, over there and has a YouTube channel that documents a lot of our adventures and a lot of radio stuff as well, not just travel, but also radio stuff. So check that out if you do. I'm sure some people probably know some of these pictures um, that I've got up here. So we've got the, the bite down the bottom left. Um, and the other three are from the from the CSR, so you've got deep pool hills up in the top right, uh, entrance to Derby uh, Springs in the bottom right, and um, I believe that's the boar. I can't remember the name of that boar now, but <laughs> um, yeah. So check out those videos; very well documented, very well edited. Um, but in terms of communication, like why is it important to us? So this is Telstra's mobile phone reception map. Some of you might have seen this. There is a lot of empty, right? A lot of empty. Um, and if we overlay where our trip on the CSR went and just the CSR part, um, you can kind of see that there's no coverage <laughs> in that entire trip. Um, there is not listed here uh, in, uh, I think it's like World 33, where you've got Kanawaraji, the community. It has an Optus microcell. And probably my one tip, if you're doing uh, outback travel and you don't want to worry about amateur radio or anything like that, is have a Telstra SIM and an Optus SIM. A lot of the stations out in the middle of nowhere actually have Optus microcells, um, but that's only useful if you have an Optus SIM. So get two SIMs. Most modern phones now have uh, eSIMs, so you can have a physical SIM and an eSIM, and that lets you switch between the two networks without messing around with physical objects and that sort of thing. Have they still got the phone booth on the corner there? Uh, I didn't remember seeing... Actually, no, I did see it. I, I was very tempted. So uh, that's an interesting point. Uh, so halfway in between, you've got that, that community there. Um, there is Telstra landline services there over their SDH um, microwave links, but Telstra has decided never to install a, a mobile um, cell site there, and but Optus has, which is bizarre. Um, but yeah, so communication in the outback, very important. We know this as, as Australians, like we've got the RFDS established in 1928. Um, it, it's very important. 
Um, we've got uh, PLBs and sat phones. And we know this sort of stuff, and we know that amateur radio itself has saved many, many lives in, um, in various scenarios. Um, but I want to make this point like really clear, is that I don't think we should be relying on amateur radio uh, for safety. So I'm going to tell you a whole bunch of fun things to do in overlanding that you can do with amateur radio but i'm going to start with talking about some safety things first because i think it's important i want i want everyone here to to survive so uh that's important to me so um but the reason why is like you know hf conditions can be unreliable the operators at the other end in amateur radio they're not trained for emergencies in in most cases so it can add some time uh getting help in that um and everything that we do is experimental so <laughs> You don't want your emergency communication tool to be uh, experimental in nature. That's just uh, a bad idea. So to start with, I want to talk about some things before we get to amateur radio. And I think one of the key ones is PLBs. Um, these have come down in price. Um, they're not massive objects like you'd have on, on boats uh, anymore. Um, so I've got one here. I won't pass it around just because I don't want anyone to accidentally set it off. And, <laughs> Uh, we have emergency service here. but this is how big it is. You can stick this in a backpack. Um, I think the battery life on these are like 10 years or something. It's, it's uh, quite a long time. They're waterproof. They um, work from satellites. So when you set it off, a satellite pass will happen, detect it, relay it back to Earth. The important thing with this though, is you need to register them. So if you get one of these, make sure you follow the instructions and register it so people know to come rescue you. Um, uh, but the other thing is, this is only an emergency thing. This, this will save you. It won't save your vehicle. It won't save your stuff. It won't save your pets. This is just for you. Um, so, uh, we have some other options though for, you know, if your vehicle is, is compromised and you need help getting spare parts or a tow truck or something like that. Um, so one of those options is the, like, Garmin InReach. Uh, these are a bit more expensive, um, but they give you like text message and email and this can be quite handy for um, from just really basic like I need to arrange this thing when I get home to when you have mobile uh, reception please call me uh, all the way up to my vehicle is stuffed can you please get a tow truck um, so yeah those are really really cool I uh, definitely recommend checking those out uh, Rusty who was on our canning stock route had one of those um, you can get weather across them, which is cool, and it's got that SOS button, so it can sort of act a little bit like a PLB in some senses, uh, which is cool. Um, and the other thing, like, we all love HF, there is VKS 737, um, and that gives you access to, like, RFDS as well, um, and the people there are trained uh, to sort of respond to these uh, emergencies or emergency-like situations. Um, and if you're using like a Coden uh, radio already for your amateur stuff, uh, you can just dump the, the VKS737 configuration, or I think there's some other HF uh, services. But probably one of my tips for this though, is if you've got a HF setup that can access RFDS um, services, document how to access them even if you don't have VKS737. Have a document printed or instructions or program it into your radio because in an emergency it does not matter if you have a license to operate on that frequency if it's a real emergency life-threatening emergency do whatever you can to to um, get help so um, that might be useful for you if you haven't looked that up before get those frequencies um, get the uh, for those you need to sell call so get something that can sell call there's an android app um, that can do the sell call for you um, and uh, make sure you know how to how to do all of that. I think, I think another thing to say there is just ideally set it up in a way and document it in a way that somebody who's not trained can do it because maybe you're you're the only trained operator and you're the one who's got a broken leg or is otherwise not able to operate it. Exactly. So make sure like that that goes for all these things. Make sure that everyone knows like everyone in your convoy or um, uh, with you knows you know where this is, how to use it. Um, uh, same with the inReach and, and this as well. I'm on a couple of different different ones like, like that and we get people coming through here all the time but also Alice Springs who've taken on off on their trip and they're often not radio but they don't know how to use the gear. Yeah. So they get power way up and they say, I've been trying to use this equipment I've paid for, I can't talk to anyone. 
Yep. So getting on there and using it, um, particularly on the on the VKS 737, call over their nets. Yep. Make sure you know what works, what channels work, and everything. Yep. Because it's just too common. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so I've talked about all the non-amateur stuff. Let's get into uh, you know why we're here, the amateur stuff. Um, so we've got some options for overlanding. I've picked up sort of the, the two uh, bands and modes that um, sort of uh, interest me when out in remote. Uh, we, one is uh, SATs um, and the other is HF. And we're also going to look at some of the different like modes, APRS and data and that sort of stuff. Um, but there's lots of options. Like these are just some of the things that I'm going to talk about. Um, there's tons of stuff that you can do and you're not just limited to, to HF. Um, there's there's, uh, you know, things that you can do just where there's low noise. I've got a question. When you're yeah. out in a re remote area and you want to use the, the set and you don't have any, any, any mobile coverage, how do you get your Kepler and data? Exactly. So that's the one thing, uh, well, one of the two things I wanted to point out with the sets is sets are fun, um, but you need to sort of plan ahead of si uh, time and you've only got a limited window in which you can use those um, TLEs and that to work out where the sat is otherwise you're just guessing and it's not going to work so uh, if you're going on a short trip um, it's something that could work um, but the other thing is like at least in, in i found in australia sats are um, underutilized but please go out use sats um, but often i'll jump on a sat and i'll hear nothing i can hear the sat but i can't hear anyone else um, uh, so often if you want to do that sort of in overlanding as a communication thing you need to have SCADs, and the other thing is the um, the satellite footprint might not line up with the person you want to talk to, and it's you know it's a bit of effort. But the plus side is the noise floor is so low that um, just on a just on a little handheld with a little antenna like this, you can make contacts, and it's it's great fun. Um, but yeah, so the sets can be fun, um, but most of this talk is going to be about uh, HF because that's what we. Uh, mostly do in our in our setup. Um, so in terms of radios, I'm struggling to read this because of the the reflection of it. Um, but uh, essentially anything that can fit in your car, and I use that loosely. But if you're using if you're going overlanding, you're storing a lot of stuff like swags and fuel and food and that. Um, so just keep in mind the the size and your you know antennas and trying to work out how to pack that all in. Um, in our setup, we've got two radios. Um, we have a 7100 that is sort of our general purpose using for voice and wind link and that sort of stuff. And then we've got a Codem 9323 that we will use for HF APRS, which I'll talk about. Um, in terms of antennas, uh, you've got your auto tuning antennas like Codem 9350s. How many people have Codem 9350s here? We've got one, two, three, four. Yeah, there's a few. Everyone loves the Codem 9350s. Um, you got mono band, um, uh, antennas, so like your Diamond HF 30 CLs, we use that for, for APRS. Um, and there's been, you know, talks previous years here about uh, antenna efficiency with different mobile uh, antennas. I'm not going to get into that. Um, but importantly, with antennas, treat them as consumables. Because if you're going through the, the bush and you're hitting all these trees with your antennas and the vibrations of the corrugations and all of that, your antennas are going to die. It's going to happen. Treat them as consumables. Have a couple of extra spares um, if you want to rely on them. Uh, just keep that in mind. So, the other thing is talking about data modes. So, voice is cool. Data is, I think, cooler. Um, but you need to get from your radio into a PC or a Raspberry Pi or something like that. Uh, lots of options. Um, I like the like the ICOM 7100 in the car because it's got like a remote head, but it also has USB, so it's really simple to interface. Um, if you don't like our coded 93, uh, 9323, uh, there's the DigiRig. I love these things, they're great. Um, they have a serial, both at TTL level and RS-232. Um, they've got a PTT GPIO and they've got audio. So they have everything that you need to interface with pretty much most radios. Um, and they're, they're teeny little devices. Um, as you can see, there's a coin next to them. Um, we actually put the DigiRig inside our Coden 9323. Um, so 
I think we have the only Coden 9323 that has a USB-C port. Um, and then in terms of like uh, uh, antennas, uh, just some notes about that is um, if you have to drive with a sand flag, you may as well turn it into an antenna. Like most sand flags are taller than your monopole uh, antennas. So Jody's done a video on, on building that. Um, the other thing is bull bars, worst place to put antennas. You notice our car has an antenna on the bull bar. Terrible place. Uh, it's convenient though, so uh, weigh that up. Um, the reason why it's bad is the vibrations on the bull bar will physically destroy the antenna a lot quicker than, than anywhere else. One mount on the bull bar, you know, with the big tuning black thing. Yep. And this big long stainless steel whip, and we we're driving along the highway of all places, and suddenly the whip just broke off it. We're at joins in and slammed yeah. back against the windscreen. Luckily it didn't break it. Yeah, we, we had um, recently a 2 and 70 antenna on the, the bull bar and just from the vibrations, you'd think the little antenna will be fine. And it just halfway along, it just snapped and, and uh, fell off and it wasn't even uh, rough stuff. It's just over time, it will, those little vibrations um, uh, and the diesel motors and that. Um, but if you know that's gonna happen, like we still mount them on the bull bar because it's a convenient place to do it. Uh, we just treat them as consumables. We know that it's going to break at some point, but it's a convenient place for us to put them. Still got, um, still got like 60, 70,000 kilometers out of it. Yeah, so like, <laughs> so it's a couple it's of years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the HF 30 CLs, one of the problems that we find is the flexing back and forth. I mean, they're not really designed for this kind of workload, but the flexing back and forwards on them, they've got a copper wire inside for the, the loading coil that will eventually snap off from the, the solder joint into the base. Um, you can fix that yourself by cutting it back and soldering it. There's video there for that. So, And I know we've had talks about car HF noise here before as well. You got ferrites, bonding stuff, even more bonding, <laughs> even more ferrites. You can go crazy with this stuff and get the noise floor really down low so you can, you can drive and use the HF radio. But if you want something dead simple, just turn the car off. If you've got a sked or something like that, just turn the car off um, and the noise floor just disappears and you're in the middle of nowhere, there's no power lines around. You've got S0, you can set that preamp to preamp two. If there was even more preamp, it didn't matter. It, it would still be S0. Um, so uh, yeah, if you're doing skeds and stuff, just turn the car off, it's a, it's a lot easier. Um, Almost guaranteed when you're out in the middle of nowhere doing a voice contact with someone, um, you will probably be able to hear them. Like they might not be able to hear you because of their city noise, but you will almost certainly be able to hear them. Um, uh, they might not move the S meter, but you'll be able to hear them. Uh, in our travels, we've had lots of uh, different sort of values. Um, the only way you can sort of work this out is just like testing, going on drives, go on short drives, but the same sort of conditions that you would for your big overlanding trip. Um, so we've had things like connectors coming loose, antennas loosening, um, foliage will just destroy antennas, um, radio mounts, like we had our ICOM 7100 with the official mount and the bolts in it and everything and that, go on a big trip, a few hundred k's over corrugations, you go look at the radio and all the bolts are gone and it's just sitting there in the <laughs> rattling around. Um, so part of that is uh, using things like Loctite and discovering these problems and trying to fix them. And then the other part is just making those problems easier to fix in the field. Um, so making sure your radio is easily accessible, your you know digital interfaces are easily accessible, you've got some spare cables, some spare nuts and bolts, um, that sort of stuff. Just being able to access stuff is actually like fairly, I find fairly important with trying to make it maintainable, um, especially in the field. Um, trying to reduce your connect account. So uh, if you can get away like removing, a, removing like with our 93323, we put the DigiRig inside. That meant we could solder the wires straight from the audio interface to the radio board. And now the only connector that we have on that is the USB-C. So we don't have to worry about audio jacks uh, coming loose and that sort of stuff. Um, Pre-start checks really important um like you've got your <laughs> you've got your car you're in the middle of nowhere um you know you should be checking things like your brake level your all your fluids make sure all your cv boots aren't done but you can also extend that out to um sort of your radio stuff so what we would do is we'd turn on the radio um uh, and 
see like with our 30 meter HF uh, APRS setup, we would see and make sure that the APRS would beacon out and it would put power out um, at the very least because there's, you know, there's times where connector comes loose, it might TX, but it doesn't put power out or the antennas come out of tune, so it doesn't put power out. Um, so yeah, you just need to test all these things. Um, our only way to find out is field testing. Um, so in terms of like what we can do with all of this stuff now that we have it, uh, voice scads, they're really, really fun. Um, some considerations with that though is um, you have to think about what band you're going to use when, but also where. As you travel further across Australia, you know, that nice 40 meter hop that you usually use starts becoming a lot better at 30 meters and eventually 20 meters. Um, so having a way to communicate that and plan, um, it can be as simple as just in the sked saying, okay, tomorrow we're going to try 30 meters. Um, if you've got other things like APRS and Windlink, you can use that to communicate, hey, 40 meters wasn't working very good. I'm going to try 20 meters tonight. Um, and having your, your buddies and that um, have access to web SDRs. So like the, I'm um, going to plug the AREG Kiwi SDR, very good SDR. You can receive anything. Uh, very useful. Thank, um, thanks for AREG for that. Um, but also, like while driving, voice can be quite useful. But you don't want to be listening to all that that static all the time. So there's a couple of options with that. We found most useful is the power level squelch that you can do on at least the 7100. You set that basically to an S unit, and it will turn off the the audio until that S unit is breached. Um, and that's enough so that you can hear like a call or something like that. Occasionally you hear like an ionosond or whatever traveling up the band. It would blip. Um, but ICOM also has VSC. I'm sure Yesu has something similar to it. Um, does anyone know what CODEN stands for? CODEN makes radios is carrier operator discriminator anti-noise. It's that S mute feature on the, on the radio. So if you're wondering what CODEN stands for, that's what it is. Um, but yeah, if you've got a CODEN, you can use the S mute. Uh, feature. But yeah, that's um, that's voice. Uh, we love APRS. Yes. Yeah, my wife and I travel around a lot around Australia and I find that on 20 metres the 14116 travel pack is very, very handy. Yeah, but it's yes. scattered every day at midday in the eastern coast, eastern, eastern part of the state. And uh, yeah, we, we found that uh, in Aminka and all that, just driving in the middle of that all of a sudden. Midday comes around, up comes the sked, yep. and you can report in, and they you've reported in the day before, so they they've got they track you uh, as you report your sked. So I found that very very handy to have. Yeah, so there's quite a few um, uh, different nets, um, and we actually printed out a uh, different schedule. We didn't really uh, use them because we had a sked with with Mark um, for our CSR. Um, journey, but we did print out the details just in case we needed someone to contact her. Um, the other frequency that I like using um, is 7045 lower sideband on um, yeah on 40 meters. Um, that can be that has a lot of uh, back and forth for, for traveling in that as well. Um, and a lot of those users um, on that frequency are using cell call with the the codons, but um, usually listening on it as well, which is cool. When I was traveling around, I was using. Uh, Twitcom 21105. Oh, nice. Mm, and, uh, that worked quite well. And then anytime 40 wasn't directing, I went to uh, 10125 and it always worked. So, nice, yeah, excellent. Never had a problem with that. Yeah, like lots of options. And you can always call CQ, is the other thing, um, if, you, if you're chasing someone. Um, we've been out places where it's like, mm, I wonder what the weather's like. We don't have cell phone reception. Let's call CQ and then someone pops up and says, hey, like if you've got internet, can you tell us what the weather's going to be like? Um, yeah. So the other thing like we really enjoy uh, doing is using APRS. Um, and this is actually more useful for not us, but uh, people that care about us, just knowing, you know, where we are, how much we've traveled in each, each day. Um, so if you haven't used APRS before, it's mostly used for position updates to say, hey, I'm, I'm here right now. Um, most people uh, that have used APRS have used it on VHF. The rules are a little bit different on HF because it doesn't have the FM capture effect. Uh, basically, you can only have one person transmitting at one time and the, the uh, area that we're talking about is a lot larger than what your VHF coverage usually is. Um, so 
what we find is we're using 300 board as well, a little bit, um, a little bit slower than the, the 1200 on VHF. And the update rate that you want to have is a lot slower. So most people suggest somewhere between five minutes and 10 minutes um, versus, you know, minutely is quite acceptable on VHF usually. Um, you can get away with setting this up with like a Raspberry Pi. Direwolf is a free and open source modem um, and any HF SSB radio that you can feed data in, like using the DigiRig or using the USB interface. Um, the thing I wanted to point out though is a lot of people with APRS, even on VHF, like the the idea for most people seems to be I get my position updated on APRS FI and someone can look at it. But there's a lot more to APRS than that. You can receive messages, you can send messages, um, you can receive, you know, where other people are. So there might be someone near you that you can see. And you don't get any of those benefits if you just put like a tracker on and you don't listen. So I suggest using, like if you're using Direwolf, connect your phone using APRS Droid. That way you can receive messages. So as we're traveling, like Mark was contacting us, VK5QI. Um, and it also allows you to do things like send quick emails and that sort of stuff. Um, the only thing with like HF APRS that's a little bit different is there's no TXI gates. And this is because just the nature of HF in the area and there's no capture effect means that we could only ever have one TXI gate in Australia without causing conflict. So uh, because of that, there's essentially none. Um, uh, so you won't get things like uh, message acts for anyone who's like, who you're sending across the internet kind of thing. Um, so just sort of keep that in mind, but getting into sort of technical details with that. Um, the other thing we used a lot on our trip was Winlink, uh, which is basically email for amateur radio. Um, and there's open source ways of doing that with like Raspberry Pi, PAT software, once again, any HF rig. There's an uh, open source modem called RDOP. So you don't need uh, like a packed door modem or like a physical packed door modem. You can do it all in software. Works really uh, useful. Over in WA, there's a lot less, uh, I think there is one now, there's a lot less Winlink nodes. So you're often using like 20 meters to get back to the the eastern states. Um, we actually had great success using 20 meters and above to get to New Zealand of all things um, to get our emails, um, but it worked and it was really good and it was uh, pretty reliable. Um, you probably have heard RDOP on the bands before, even if you haven't done digital, those weird noises that you hear is someone trying to check their emails. Um, but probably the key thing with this one, um, you can have like non-amateurs send you uh, emails and receive emails from you, but you need to make them aware of, you know, what the rules are, make them aware that it's public, make them aware that please don't send me a two megabyte picture because it's going over, you know, HF channel, um, that's quite noisy. So, um, and also the other thing is they have to uh, be on your allow list. So the one way is you can log into a console and type in all the emails, or you can send them an email over WinLink and they'll automatically get added to that, that list. But that's another thing to sort of test beforehand, make sure it's all working, make sure everyone understands how it works. And you don't need a modern radio. I used to use an FC707 from the 80s, yep. hooked up to a signal, uh, SigLink and not a problem. Yeah. You said to sit there, just the VFO a bit. Yep. It drifted, but yeah. Yeah, we've uh, used the 93234. Uh, um, I think I, even got it running over like 7727 as well. Um, yeah, it's, as long as it's a HF SSB rig that, you know, can pass some fairly flat audio, it's it's fine. This guy in Perth that runs a uh, 40 meter APRS eye gate. Yeah. Mm. Nice. It goes six ham. It goes six ham. Yeah. Of course I do. So that's some of the more, I guess, practical and semi-serious things that you can do on um, when you're overlanding. Um, and we found them quite like useful for just keeping in touch with family, making sure people know where we are, um, that sort of thing. The only thing like I'd sort of mention with that is uh, just make people aware that like if you don't, you know, 
ping a location for a day that they don't freak out because you know your radio has died or something like that like just make them make them aware that it's experimental and you might not you might not show up on the map for a day or two or you might have to communicate a different way um but yeah uh useful stuff let's try fun stuff so SSTV, this is a really easy thing to get into. A lot of people think it's quite hard to get into, but you can do this with a phone now. Um, you can download apps to decode SSTV. You can download apps to encode SSTV. You don't even need a USB interface to your radio. You can just hold the phone up to the speaker. The, all these images on the, on the right here, they were sent by just holding the phone up to the, the microphone and transmitting. Um, so you don't have to make this a complex thing where you need to pull out a laptop to send someone a picture while you're on your journey. Um, and you can add it as part of your voice scan because it's that sort of simple. Um, the other thing you can do is use the standard SSTV frequencies. Um, can't remember them off the top of my head. 20 meters is 14230. I think uh, 40 meters is one, uh, 7171. 7, yeah. yeah. Um, so they'll end up on the the like SSTV webcams and, and stuff. But yeah, something to add to your skeds. Really, really fun. Um, the other thing we played with is VHF, HF, digipeating. So sometimes we would park up somewhere and we want to go on a you know a bit of a hike. It might not be too far, but still, if you you know with no one around and stuff. Um, can be quite useful to still communicate like where your position is and you're walking here and that sort of stuff. So when you're in the middle of nowhere, there's no VHF APRS coverage. Um, but if you've already got a HF radio set up and you also have a VHF radio, what you can do is connect the two together. So I use Die Wolf um, and basically during our little walk here through the um, Bungle Bungles, we'll uh, HF digipeating the packets back. I think we may have just had marginal phone signal, but um, yeah, it was really good. We got we were able to send and receive messages over, over HF. Um, and so that was using one of these uh, UV98 radios. It's my new favorite radio because it does APRS. It's got APRS built in, it's got GPS built in. It's also got Bluetooth, so you can connect your phone to it and send and receive messages. So, um, uh, but yeah. The, this is the um, UV98, HG UV98. Um, yeah. Um, you won't get it in this color, sorry. This is, this is, that's custom. Um, so the only sort of gotcha with this one is you don't want to uh, flood the HF network. So you need to make sure that you're not digipeating normal like if you roll into town and there's suddenly all this VHF traffic, you don't want that to end up uh, on on HF because it it will just be your radio won't even keep up with the amount of traffic. Um, so there's some details how we set that up to filter packets and that. Um, but yeah, basically VHF radio, like handheld radio, to our ICOM 7100 uh, running on two meters or 70 centimeters, and then into uh, the Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi goes, oh, I've seen a packet, I want to send it out over HF, sends it to the code in 90, uh, 9323, and then it's picked up by the rest of the, the um, HF, uh, DGP, uh, HF I gates, um, like VK5, AIG, and a whole bunch of other ones, and then into the internet. So, um, and this works uh, well with like using APRS Droid on your phone to um, send messages and stuff. So once again, not just limited to position updates, also sending and receiving messages. Wait, yes. When you do this, are you running everything in the car with the accessory battery? Um, so yes, um, we have, our car electrical system is quite complex, um, but we basically have a system that allows us to keep accessory power turned on uh, uh, to the Pi. Um, well, we have an external battery system from the car, which we uh, power stuff uh, based on the accessory power, but we can override that. So when we go on these walks, we put that system into a specific mode that lets that continue powering off our lithium uh, system, which is like 
200 amp hours, I think, at this point. Yeah, it's complicated. <laughs> um, but if you do want to see that, uh, we can show you at the car. The other thing is a uh, wind link to social media. So sort of bridging that gap um, into more modern, um, modern tech. We have, uh, during our trip, um, I wanted to post things on my Twitter account. And the problem is you've got this beautiful image that you want to send. It's two megabytes off the camera or even more. How do you get that onto Twitter? And how do you have a system to even receive that? Um, so I ended up using like Winlink because that's what we've, we've been using uh, to keep up to date with people. All those nodes already exist, so I can sort of piggyback off that. The only problem is getting that picture size down. So I kind of built this like custom version of Avif. So uh, Avif is an image compression that's used for between frames in videos. Um, uh, so extended that to basically make it even smaller by removing some of the known information. Um, and then there's a gateway that receives those emails and posts it onto Twitter. So the end result is you, you uh, upload this picture to Winlink. Winlink uh, sends it across the radio. Um, something at the other end receives it and posts it onto, onto Twitter. Yeah, it's open source and you can have a look at it. It's very specific to me, but it was something fun to to do to being in the middle of nowhere and still being able to tweet pictures uh, was really cool. Um, and this is just sort of a comparison against like on the right side, it might not be easy to see on the screen, but on the right side is the JPEG equivalent, which is bigger in size and um, the uh, AVIF version on, on the left, which is uh, even smaller than the JPEG. Um, and you can compare the, the quality difference there. Also a far superior picture on AVIF than what it is on JPEG. Yes, yep. So, yeah, so you can see, if you come up close, you can see the, the difference in there. Um, yeah, so um, then there's sort of quality of life stuff. So Geordie's built this uh, tool called Radio Console, and you can configure all these little buttons on it, um, and it's a little pie display that sits at the front of the car. And... Uh, I think Geordie sort of originally built it for this pan adapter feature to give our 7100 a pan adapter. Um, but what we use it for most now is just going, pressing a button, and it uh, sends rig control commands to configure all the radios to be in the correct mode. So if we're just driving, it can be in um, normal APRS beacon mode. And if we're going for a walk, we can press a button and it reconfigures all the radios for DigiPeat mode. And it puts it on the right frequency with the right filters and the right mode and um, the right levels and all of that sort of stuff so we don't have to worry about you know changing 10 dozen things on the radio to put it into the correct configuration so there's a link there to um, details um, about that um, but yeah it's great to just go i want win link now and everything is just configured you don't have to worry about it um, very very handy so finally I just want to mention some things that we haven't done um, and we'll probably look at in the future, but things that might interest you more than more than me. Um, there's lots of things you can do in amateur radio, uh, as we all know. Some of the things that I think would be interesting trying overlanding is things like PSK mail. So that's sort of like Winlink, but using PSK. Not sure how many nodes there are still running. It seems to be fairly old and dated, but it seemed like a uh, maybe an easier approach than Winlink. Um, there's JS8 call. Um, so if you're not familiar with JS8 call, it's sort of like FT8, but longer um, back and forwards messages. So it's more like a more like RITI, I guess. Um, but there's also an APRS version of that where you can send APRS packets. So that I think would be fun. Winlink has location updates um, similar to APRS. Um, I need to look at that. I have no idea anything about it. Um, there's digital voice and free DV is something that um, interests me. Uh, I want to work out how to do cell calls on the 7100 without spending too much money. Um, and APRS telemetry, and this is just like a nerdy, quirky thing, is I want to get like some of the CAN bus data out of our car and then upload it to APRS somehow. Um, I think that'd be fun and cool to play around with. Um, 
but yeah and there's also loads of different traveler nets that you can um, check in on so but yeah that's uh sort of what i had today um hopefully that gives you an idea of like some of the things that we've done um with our setup and if you want to look at like specific details about like you know how we mount our radio and our car what antennas we're using or you know want to see a practical demonstration of Winlink running our cars over there um, just bug us and we'll um, try and get something sorted out so um, and that QR code takes you to the these slides so if you want to look at these slides again um, that's the QR code for it but yeah that's sort of it so, um, what you're doing here uh, in Australia is, I mean, we all think it's a lot of fun and we can jump in a car and you spend a little bit of money and a bit of fuel money and you get to go, get to go a long way and, and do these really interesting trips. But um, I think what we can do here is fairly unique in the world to be able to do that and to do it in relative safety. Uh, we're not going to sort of rub, run into bands of gorillas that are going to take everything we have and uh, so forth. Uh, so how much feedback have you had from other operators around the rest of the world or even YouTube fans uh, about what you do here. Yeah, like that's an interesting point. I always, um, when people say Australia is so scary with the spiders and snakes, I think like you've got bears, like bears. Um, <laughs> uh, no, it's like really interesting because you talk to someone from the US and they've got, you know, similar sort of uh, off-roading trails that they do, but you look at them and they, you know, will go one day and then stop in this town or um, they're never out of cell phone uh, reception for, for very long, so it's it's a very different experience. And um, when you tell someone, "Hey, we're going to go on this trip for two weeks without like contacting anyone, and we've been away for seven days and haven't seen a single vehicle," um, it does kind of blow people's minds and um, takes a bit to sort of even for some people to sort of understand that that's like a reality um, in some of the travel we do. Case in point, the Rubicon Trail. Anyone heard of that? Yeah. Famous, famous trail in the US. It's 25 kilometers long <laughs> for the uh, for the actual Rubicon Trail section. Yeah. Um, are you using um, APRS to get weather and stuff as well? Uh, no. So the with HF, um, because you don't have all that many much in the way of TXI gates. Um, it's kind of just push stuff out there and it's very unlikely that you'll get a response um, back. Um, there are codes, because I was getting weather reports when we were up in the Alps. If you send a code, um, they'll send back um, like the Bureau of Meteorology um, weather facts, that sort of stuff, but over Windlink. Yeah. So that's something I wanted to look into is like stuff over like getting weather automated weather reports over Windlink. Um, I yeah don't know how to <laughs> how to do that, but it definitely interests me. Um, yeah, basically, you just send a, a burst saying I want this data, and then the eye gate at the other end. I was using New Zealand by chance will yeah. collate it and send it back, and then next time you're on, you'll receive them. I'd love to know more about that. <laughs> you can pick the area you want to cover, you can pick the number of days you want to cover, and it just sends back to you. Oh, wow. That's cool. Okay. Do you want maps or just data or yeah. whatever? I need to. I need that information. Excellent. <laughs> um, well, had one, having worked in the battery industry, um, one of the most important killers of batteries is corrugated roads. So if you're going to do trips like this, don't just rely on the vehicle battery. Yep. Always have a spare battery packed in some sort of um, a vibration proof container that you don't know, sponge rubber yep. sticking in. So at least you've got something that can fall back on. It's nice having spare fuel and all the rest of it. But if you kill a battery, that's the end of it. Yeah. And especially in um, like we've got an automatic, so we can't just push start it or anything like that. So um, yeah, very important for us. We've got um, we've got two lithiums and a, um, a fairly beefy uh, lead acid. When we did the trip, we actually had two lead acids and one lithium. Um, but yeah, we have the option there of uh, I guess self jump starting as well um, with our lithiums. And w one of our lithiums we can actually uh, run the car off as well. Uh, what actually happens is that 
the vibration loose the, loosen the active material and it falls into the sump trap in the bottom of the battery and eventually shorts all the right. plates out. Yep. That's what happens. Not good. I was, on a similar vein, I was going to say, do you run uh, marine grade batteries or four wheel drive off road batteries because I figure their constructions are much more uh, ruggedized than your ordinary car battery, which could be a mistake for some people, but you saying you still got problems, Bob, even if you use those sorts of batteries? No, they have, um, you can buy batteries that have got fiberglass packing in there to hold the active material in place. Yep. So you can get a ruggedized version of a heavy duty battery, but it's got fiberglass reinforcement. Okay. Yeah, and so the battery that like we have for cranking off is, um, I think like a semi-cycle as well. It's sort of uh, designed for overlanding. That being said, I wouldn't rely on it as the only source. Um, so yeah. One question on another thing is if you had radios fall to bits inside or phones or uh, any other uh, gear, uh, raspberry pies, that sort of thing where you know, they're not ruggedized enough, then they just tend to vibrate themselves to pieces. Surprisingly not. Most of our issues have been connectors, which is why I said reduce the connector count. The actual devices themselves, like we haven't had issues with the 7100 or the Coden 9350. And considering like when we did the trip, the um, iteration of the Coden uh, 9323 that I had was just lots of loose wires in there. I'm surprised it survived at all, um, but it did. Um, but yeah, most of the issues that we've had is like connectors um, vibrating loose and, and that sort of uh, stuff. Like surprisingly, like 3.5 millimeter connectors seem to, I think maybe because of the springs in them or the, the vibrations, they sort of loosen and push their way out or, or something like that. We've run into that a couple of times. Um, but devices themselves, like the 7100 and Raspberry Pis and like, all of those have been fine with the vibration. It's just the connectors leading into them. Well, thanks, Bickler. That was uh, excellent. Uh, I think we've learned a bit from uh, from this, and it's something that many of us want to do, and, and those who have done it want to do it again. Uh, we'll probably take a, a five-minute break. Uh, I'm not sure if Trevor's here somewhere. Uh, yep. Yeah, okay. And we'll um, and then we'll set up the uh, the next talk. So don't go too far away. We're uh, fairly close to being able to kick that one off. We'll just give them a few minutes to uh, set up. So talk amongst yourselves.